Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an extension economist with NDSU Extension. Uh, my pleasure, uh, again, uh, this Friday to moderate our ongoing uh, webinar series, uh, looking at the impacts of COVID and other things going on in the egg markets. This webinar and all previous webinars, as well as the corresponding uh, presentations are available online. Uh, but with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Parman. Hey, thanks, Dave. All right, so today's presentation is gonna focus pretty heavily on uh, employment or unemployment, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, North Dakota's tax situation. And the unemployment, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the national numbers like I have been doing, but I'm also going to kind of look at some of the reports that have come out of North Dakota here recently. So my first slide, this again shows those weekly initial jobless claims, and we are trending in the right direction. But this is still uh, an extremely high number of people week over week uh, filing for unemployment. Every single one of these bars uh, to the right of uh, the March 9th that you see on that chart uh, would have been a record in and of itself, including this uh, yesterday's numbers would have been a record, would have smashed records uh, several times over. So while it is the number of initial claims has slowed down a lot, there is still a historically high number of people filing for unemployment each week. And then if you look at my next char chart uh, from, the, from the Federal Reserve, it also shows continuous claims. And while we are off the peak, and these, remember, continuous claims are people who filed for multiple weeks in a row. So they're staying on unemployment. It's not just a one week thing and then they go back to their job or even two weeks. They're, they're staying on it for a, an extended period of time. And this is kind of stabilized, which as the economy has begun to reopen, some of these, some jobs are returning, but many of them have not yet. And therefore we have this uh, continuous uh, jobless claims number that's basically holding holding steady and the enhanced unemployment benefits uh, may be affecting that to some degree so, some folks that that extra six hundred dollars per week that the, the federal government is, is kicking in um, could be making a I, I believe it's every two weeks maybe making a big difference so this is North Dakota's uh, weekly new jobless claims and continuous claims basically the same same data uh, as the national numbers, but for uh, North Dakota uh, specifically. Now, uh, what you see is it basically mimics the um, national numbers, okay? So initial jobless claims spiking very high uh, right there in that first week of April and then trending down, but still very high by North Dakota standards. And the continuous jobless claims on the right being kind of sticky. Uh, persistent, basically, kind of, it trended down off the highs, but but staying uh, uh, for a state is is actually setting a record. So my next slide kind of illustrates this. It's the uh, our unemployment statistics, and we look at April, uh, March, and then April of 2019 for comparison. Labor force is about the same, 405,000 in April of 20, 401,000, 401 and a half in in 2019. Uh, April. And the unemployment rate very low beginning uh, in March and staying at about two and a half percent in April of last year. And we've uh, exploded to 9.2%. Um, 37,311 unemployed individuals in North Dakota, which is a record. Now our population is the highest it's ever been, but still this is a very high number. However, our unemployment rate does is hovering well below the uh, national rate. So 9.2% in North Dakota in April. The national un unemployment rate back then was 14.7, almost 14 and a half. So my next slide just shows a map of the unemployment rate by county. And this is before COVID. So very low in the, the majority of the state, well below 5% mo for most places, at or below 5%. Some places extremely low around two, one and 2%. And then my next slide shows the what's happened since COVID. You see down here in the southeast by Richland County, 15% uh, dub, double digit unemployment, some manufacturing down there that shut down uh, areas like Fargo, almost 10%, uh, Burley County, um, just north of 10% and up in the northwest where a lot of oil and gas uh, production is going on, appro approaching or exceeding double digit unemployment in that area as well for the state. So if we want to look at what jobs were lost, uh, my next slides kind of do that. So this is an area graph, 
okay? The bigger the box, the more jobs that were lost. So if we look at the week ending March 21st of 2020, North Dakota had almost 6,000 initial jobless claims, and most of those came from accommodation and food services. So these would be restaurant workers, hotel workers, those kind of folks. They made up the bulk of it, healthcare a little bit, construction, mining and gas to some degree, retail and other areas uh, rounding it out. But again, this accommodation and food service were the jobs that were initially hit in, in our state. Now my next slide shows April, which is uh, the middle of it, you know, kind of the height when a lot of uh, filings were happening. Uh, then all of a sudden it hit manufacturing really hard and uh, mining, oil and gas. Um, you, it still had accommodation and food services being impacted as well as retail trade and healthcare. And then the rest of these rounded out and we had 10,000, 10 and a half thousand people uh, apply for unemployment that week. Now, if we come to the latest chart, uh, what you see is mining and gas, as well as healthcare, manufacturing, and now educational services are seeing the largest amount of layoffs, where accommodation and food service a much smaller percentage, and that's just because the folks, a lot of folks already lost their job or were laid off, furloughed, whatever the case may be, uh, in that sector initially and remain that way. And I just point out in the lower right-hand corner of the amount that were lost from ag forestry or fishing or hunting, and that, that's been a very low percentage this whole time, but as far as direct workers in those industries, there aren't that many relative to restaurant and uh, uh, workers in accommodation and food services, as well as the gas and oil field. So my next slide, I want to show this graph on uh, oil and gas tax revenue collected, as well as uh, 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 forecasted tax and fees for the general fund. Okay, so the top graph is oil and gas tax revenue. The dotted line is the projection from the 2019 legislative revenue forecast. And then the black line is the actual. And you can see what May, April and May looked like. And May was particularly poor for tax, uh, tax collection in the oil and gas revenue area. Now, April wasn't as bad. It was below projection, but May was particularly bad. And then if you look at the general funds like sales tax and those other things, we missed the mark in April, but May again was a was a much uh, worse month as far as taxes and fee collection versus uh, versus April. But you also notice in some of these in this chart that we have months that we exceeded our collection forecasts. Uh, for instance, last winter, November and December of 2019, quite a bit above the forecast. September of 2019, quite a bit above, as well as July. So my next slide shows a table of what these actually fee, the, what the fees actually were. So this is from the June report for the 2020 general fund. So the June report is referring to May, what was collected in May. So it's a, a month behind, but you see at the bottom, it says total general funds uh, actually collected 152 million projected was 188 million. So a shortfall in May of $36 million for the general fund. Most of that coming from sales taxes, not collected. Forecast was 77 million and the actual was 50. Uh, that's, a, that's a big number. And then uh, also individual income taxes were way down collected and uh, motor vehicle excise taxes in terms of raw dollars. So that, that makes up the bulk of it. But if you look to the right, the, the three columns to the right down near the bottom, total general fund revenues, the actual is 2.38 billion. Uh, and the forecast was 2.36 billion. So we actually still have an uh, excess over the projection because of those periods I told you about last year, uh, when you looked at the line chart, that we actually had better months, uh, several of them in, uh, in, in 2019. And so, so far, we really don't have a big shortfall uh, below the projections yet. Now this could, this continues and obviously we will because we're basically right at projection, but so far uh, it hasn't been as, it, it doesn't look as dire as maybe some thought it might be. Uh, but, but again, we have to wait and see how things shake out going forward. And then my, my next slide shows the same thing uh, for May oil and gas. This one's May for April um, and, uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is the June report for May 2020. And you see that oil uh, had a shortfall of a, a oil and gas tax collection of 108 million. So very, very significant. Uh, but again, the actual versus the forecast is pretty close. We're only down about 2% over the projection, 1.96 uh, billion versus approximately a forecast of 2 billion. So, so far, uh, we, we, we're not facing a massive shortfall yet. 
uh, for the biennium. We, we did last month, but we had some good months leading up to it that as a state has, we're, we're right on the forecast, but looking, looking forward again, how long is this going to last? I expect uh, oil and gas taxes may stay lower, uh, the collection of such uh, for the next few months. Uh, are we going to see a continued downward trend of sales taxes and those kind of things that we count on uh, tremendously for the general fund? We'll have to see. But that's where we stand right now, that we're basically right at projection. And so going forward is going to be extremely important in how much commerce we have going on, sales tax collections, oil and gas taxes, those kind of things. But for now, uh, again, we're, we're basically right on uh, where, where our forecasts were for, the, for this period in the biennium. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Frayne Olson. Uh, he, he's our next speaker, and uh, thank you guys for listening. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, so this week, I'd, I'd like to uh, basically provide a, a brief update to the marketing plan discussion uh, that, that I did on May 29th. Um, so as, as we go through this, I'd like to, again, periodically give some updates. So on my first slide, I just want to remind, remind everybody, as you're putting a marketing plan together, there's several key pieces. Uh, my, my earlier discussion was really on setting these pricing objectives and timing objectives. Um, what I want to highlight today is a little bit about marketing, managing or monitoring the, the market conditions. And again, Whenever you're looking at a marketing plan, obviously we always have new information entering the marketplace, people's attitudes and perspectives change as we move through time because we just have more information and, and more things have happened. So just because you've put the marketing plan together doesn't mean you can just set it aside and say, all right, let's, you know, we're done with that. Let's move on to something else. So on my next slide, I, I identified in the previous discussion, what are some of the key things that I'm going to be watching throughout the summer now that might change this market psychology? What, what might change both a buyer's and seller's attitudes about what the future will bring? And I'm, this week, I just really want to focus in on the weather concerns and how that might be uh, impacting yields and, and also crop quality. Um, later on, again, we'll, we'll follow through on some of the, uh, for example, export sales. And if there are some questions about U.S.-China relations, we can certainly talk about that during the Q&A period. So on my next slide, I just want to remind everybody again that if you look back historically at kind of what's happening for the variability or the volatility of prices, in particular for that harvest delivery month. So for corn, we kind of zero in on the December uh, Chicago futures contract, kind of use that as, the, as a pricing point that the local elevators will determine what the local uh, uh, actual cash price will be. Um, again, this is information ad updated as of last night, as of the close of marketing yesterday, uh, the market uh, trading yesterday. So the red line on the very bottom is where we're at today in, the, in today's futures market for the December contract. I have that um, kind of middle range in this June, July, August timeframe uh, circle just to highlight the, the high degree of volatility, this big shifts in expectations that we have as we go through these summer growing months. And again, if there's going to be an opportunity or some kind of market scare um, that will put up lift into crop prices, the most likely event will be a weather problem or some kind of concern about how many bushels we're actually can produce, going to produce. So it'll be really a supply side response. Um, we can have rallies from the demand side, but again, it's really because of, of unexpected export sales. That's the primary result or cause of that. So this is for December corn futures. If you look at the next slide, it's the same chart, only reflecting the November soybean contract. And you can see, again, uh, circled in the middle point portion there is that June, July, August time frame. Again, we tend to have a lot of market variability, a lot of shifting in, in prices and kind of expectations are how big the crop is going to be. And then the, the, the final slide in this sequence is for spring wheat. And again, I cheated a little bit and used the December contract rather than the September one, simply because I wanted to have this, this kind of consistent time frame between corn, soybeans, and wheat. But again, as you can see that, that June, uh, that really the July, August time period is, is probably that critical um, time, time frame for the spring wheat market. So again, I just want to remind everybody where we're at right now. On my next slide, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the new information that enters the marketplace that can change traders' perspective. And, and we have to understand that not everybody trading futures market contracts have a real deep understanding of what goes on in production agriculture. 
um, as, as farmers or as, as processors or buyers of grain, people that are actively engaged in buying and selling cash grain, we understand a lot of the, these production issues, but we do have folks in the, in, that are speculators, in particular from the finance uh, community, that will start trading the, the, the grain futures markets that really don't have a solid understanding of kind of the production cycle and the production process. And so some of the information that they, where do they go to to get information about how things are going? And again, one of those pieces of information, whether we agree with it or not, is, is the weekly USDA crop progress report. And again, this crop progress report, in particular, when we look at crop conditions, I know it, uh, a lot of farmers have kind of pointed to that and say, boy, where do they get those numbers and how do they come up with that? Well, to give you an idea, there's about 3,600 um, enumerators or, or respondents. There's people that will every week will, will uh, usually at a county level, uh, drive around and report on what are the crop conditions within that region. Now, a lot of times the people that are filling out these surveys are, are county agents. Sometimes there are other FSA officials or people that will fill out the, the these weekly crop progress reports. And please understand, this is a very subjective um, opinion. This is a subjective viewpoint of, you know, given the, the conditions that I see in my area, what percentage of the crop would be rated as a very poor, poor, fair condition, good condition, or excellent condition. And, and again, USDA does have some basic guidelines for how you would try to quantify that from a, from a, so that we have some consistency. So I don't want to put a lot of pressure on these numbers, although the, the trade and, and market analysts and market traders do spend a lot of time looking at this and studying it. So this is the, um, the crop condition report. It comes out every Monday. This is for June 14th. So this would be last Monday's report. And it gives a breakdown, not only for the nation, um, the 18 primary states that grow corn. And again, if you notice on the very bottom, it says these 18 states that are represented in this survey account for about 91% of the corn acreage, at least in 19, uh, 2019. Um, so we're picking up these, the heart of the Corn Belt, where the, what states are, are really core corn producing regions, and, and they do have an average across the state, as well as, again, the blue bar that, or the blue row that I've identified as the 18 state average. Now, the way I like to use this, and I think the way that most market analysts and most traders look at it, is what are today's numbers relative to the previous week? Um, there are some analysts that will look at you know, the numbers today versus the previous year, again, which is the very bottom row, or they'll look at, at, a, at a longer time series saying, well, if we look back historically, what are these conditions relative to what we've seen in the past? And then trying to make some correlations or relationships, what does that mean for our final yields? My personal view and opinion is that's a, a bit dangerous. It, the The those relationships, there are relationships there, but they're a bit fuzzy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not terribly confident to be able to look backwards and say, well, at this time last year or this time two years ago or five years ago, the crop condition ratings were X, and that means we have the yield potential of Y. I, I, I just feel a little uncomfortable doing that. But I do know there's a lot of traders will look at today's numbers or the most recent report relative to last week's numbers because then it'll give us an idea of what's happening to the change in conditions. And if you notice on corn, um, the, the June 14th number versus the previous week of June 7th, you know, the good range was 56% rated good last uh, this that uh, on Monday, a week before it was 60% was rated good. And so there's been a little bit of a slippage in, in some of those, those fields that were rated good, they may have now slipped into that fair category. Again, noticing on the excellent, we had about 15% of the crop uh, was rated excellent last week as well as this week. So when we're looking at what is happening and forming expectations about what we think the rest of the season will bring, it's this change from week to week to week that a lot of the analysts and traders are looking at. Okay, so if we, next slide, we move on to the same table but we're looking at the soybeans. And, and again, on a sidebar, I want to, I, I rank these according to um, the size of the total production. So Illinois is, is typically the largest soybean producer in the US. 
Then we go to Iowa, Minnesota, Indiana, Nebraska. And I, I did add North Dakota in here just because, you know, it is interesting to follow what's going on in our state as well. So I just chose the top five uh, producers of, of corn, soybeans, and wheat, and then I, I included North Dakota for reference. If we look at the soybean condition, again, basically unchanged from last week. Um, and I just also want to comment the previous year, at this time last year, there wasn't anything reported because the soybean planting progress was so far, with, so far delayed. So um, again, planting progress this year was well ahead of what we saw last year. So again, last year, there wasn't even a report at this point because a lot of the, the seed hadn't even come out of the ground yet. So I, at early on in the season, I don't want to again, put a lot of weight or emphasis on these numbers, but it's the change from week to week to week that is really important to follow. And then on the next slide, it's the same information for spring wheat, um, the spring wheat condition. And I did list all of the six major crops producing spring wheat. Um, and again, when you look at this week's numbers versus last week's numbers, we had a little bit of a slippage. Some of those, those fields that were rated excellent previously from last week kind of slipped into that good category um, this week. So again, not major shifts, not major changes, uh, but so far, even though it's early in the season, crop condition and crop condition ratings seem to be coming along pretty well. So on my next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, progress on the winter wheat harvest. And again, in this region, um, what happens in the winter wheat world ha obviously has an impact on the spring wheat information or spring wheat prices. And every week, uh, the U.S. Wheat Associates uh, tracks not only harvest progress, but they also take samples of, uh, or samples of wheat are, are submitted for testing. Uh, from each state and then those are, are summarized and reported so we get an average of kind of what's the crop quality as we start moving through harvest as well. Now there was a report, uh, this report was updated today uh, but the update came just a few minutes ago and so I wasn't able to change my slides to accommodate it but um, as of uh, today's report, June 19th report, um, Texas harvest was about 63% complete versus 49% last last week. Oklahoma is 92% complete versus 36% last week. And Kansas is at 22% uh, complete this week versus 1% last week. So the, the core harvest of, of winter wheat is now moving into the southern Kansas. Um, we're getting some yield reports. Um, again, yields have been all over the board, recognizing that there was some freeze damage in, um, in, in parts of of, of the panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma and also into southern Kansas. There was also some areas that have been pretty dry for a while. So yields are, have been very extremely variable, uh, anywhere from 20 bushel per acre to over 60 bushel per acre. As a reference point, USDA last year tracked the average winter wheat crop at about 53, almost 54 bushels per acre. So it looks like yields are coming in um, at least right now, similar, although we're getting into, again, the heart of, of Kansas wheat country. So we'll have to watch that from week to week. On test weights, the test weights have actually been very good. Um, test weights from 58 to 65 pounds per acre. The average uh, for the samples that have come in so far is about 62 pounds. And again, just recognizing a 60 pound per acre basis, uh, 60 pound per per bushel, excuse me, basis is kind of the standard. So we're looking at, at some some pretty good test weights. Whenever you have higher test weights, that usually leads to somewhat lower protein content, and that is starting to show up now. Uh, again, protein levels in the winter wheat crop, hard red winter wheat crop specifically, has been very considerably quite variable. Um, the range anywhere from 9% to 14% with about 11% average. And again, that's, a, that's slightly below what we saw last year in 2019. And if you'll notice that the price differential, that price spread between hard red spring wheat and the hard red winter wheats is starting to widen out again now. So spring wheat is now starting to take a bit more of a premium um, over winter wheat in the futures market, which is typically what happens when we have lower than average uh, protein content. On the next slide, I want to shift into a little bit of the weather. Um, I'm not a weather forecaster. I'm not pretending to be one, but it is obviously something that the markets watch very, very closely. Most of the market analysts and traders, again, have a particular weather service or weather person that they follow very closely that they tend to rely on for information. But I also wanted to give some reference points. There's different places you can go 
to get an idea of, well, what are not only the current soil moisture conditions, but then again, some, some information on crop conditions. Um, one of the places you can go that actually has some very nice high resolution maps that are updated about every week is uh, NASA. Actually, there's a, a new program that they have that they're trying to follow soil moisture conditions. And what they're doing, at least this is one map of several that they have within their, their, their deck or their available, available set. Um, and what's looking at, this is the estimated, again, a computer generated estimate of what is the uh, root zone soil moisture relative to a long-term average. And the long-term average is from 1948 through 2012. So this is a very, very long time period. And the different color shadings you're seeing is on a percentile basis. So it's, it's saying, well, if you go, if you rank everything from zero to 100, where, where within that range would this fall? So anything in the blue range is a high percentile. It's showing that based on history, there's a, a larger level of soil moistures than, than we've seen in the past. And obviously anything in the, in the um, yellows or browns or red would be below average. I do wanna comment really quickly, if you notice kind of in that Devil's Lake area in North Dakota, up kind of in that Northeast corner there, there's, there's kind of a red spot. And, and I'm trying to figure out exactly why that's showing up. Um, I think a large portion of it is because of the time frame, and that there were several years in a row where that region, in particular in the Devil's Lake Basin, um, had very, very high soil moisture levels. And so when you compare, you average those in versus what we see today, which is probably more normal, we start to see that differential showing up. So I do think there's some anomalies a little bit in the data set right now. If you go to the next slide, this is another way of, of looking at, again, soil moisture conditions. We've talked about this a little bit in the, in the past. Um, this is much more uh, hydrologically, you know, what do we see with soil moisture conditions? It's not always based on crop and cropping stress, but we use other indicators. And so again, there's a couple different ways that the market looks at weather information and where we're sitting right now is the crop under stress or not. On the next slide, um, these are the forecasts and I'm using the National Weather Service. Again, these are typically for longer range forecasting. National Weather, weather Service is commonly commented on or used as a reference point. Again, a lot of market traders and analysts will use their own market or their own weather people that they follow for, for information. But again, this becomes kind of the standard or the benchmark that a lot of folks use. So if we look at the um, eight to 14 day forecast moving forward in time, um, and, and understand what this is saying now, again, the green means that there's a high probability or an above average probability that will, or there was a prob good strong probability there'll be um, uh, a rainfall where the precipitation that we're gonna see moving into that eight to 14 day program will, uh, time period will happen, that the probability is very high that that, that region will, will receive some rainfall. Uh, the gray areas where, where it's basically a, a normal rainfall that they're saying there's, there's equal chances of, or 50-50 chance, if you will, of having average, either above average or below average rainfall. And again, we get into the beiges and, and reds. It's, it's the, the probability, there's a strong probability there'll be below average rainfall. So if you look at this and you look at the, the core corn belt, that corn soybean producing area, um, we're seeing that they're gonna have, there's a, a little above average probability of, of seasonal rainfall, which is good for crop development. So right now, the combination of good soil moisture conditions and the, the forecast for adequate rainfall, uh, the majority of the corn and soybean producing region looks like it's gonna be in pretty good shape. On the next slide, um, we're gonna look at the temperatures. And again, you read this very similar to what the what the um, rainfall probabilities are. Um, you know, is it gonna be a, is there a strong probability of having above average uh, temperatures versus below average temperatures? And again, you'll notice that in that core corn producing region, you, you know, you get into uh, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, um, it's, there's a good probability to be below average temperatures. Um, and I just wanna remind everybody when we talk about below average temperatures in Missouri and Iowa, it's actually reasonably comfortable. It's not as, 
um, their, their average temperatures this time of year are much warmer than they are up here in North Dakota. So um, it, again, it's looking very favorable for crop development and for crop progress. So right now, it, there's really nothing on the horizon that would give us an indication we're going to be running into some major crop production problems um, yet. Obviously, we, there's still a lot of the growing season remaining. My next slide, I, I wanted to remind everybody about these pricing targets. Um, so the blue lines are those psychological barriers we talked about previously, kind of support and resistance levels. Um, those blue lines in this set of charts are identical to what I did at the end of May or in the May 29th um, session. Um, so we'll, we can see that so far, at least on the corn market, this is December corn again, that we have been able to break through that first resistance level. So we're now kind of in that, that middle range. We're kind of bouncing between the 340 and 355 range. Um, again, there's, there's got to be some reason, some change in people's view of the future to help continue to lift prices as we move forward. So it looks like we've now uh, kind of broken through that first layer, but we're still within this trading range of about 340 to 355. On the next slide, this will be for September, uh, for, excuse me, November soybean futures. Uh, it's very similar thing happened. We broke through that first core resistance level. Um, we've now moved into a slightly higher trading range between about 865 and let's say um, 890. Um, and we've been bouncing within that range for, for several days now. Again, I, I pulled these graphics from the market close yesterday. So it does not include today's uh, market activity, but it, it's based off of the closing yesterday. And then my last slide, um, which is for September hard red spring wheat futures. Um, again, we broke through that uh, 525 level. Um, if I were to redraw these support and resistance levels today, I'd, I'd move that, that top blue line up just a little bit to probably a 540 range. So it looks like we're, we're, again, trading within that boundary of about 525 to 540. Um, I do think wheat has some, spring wheat in particular, has some possibility to move that through that, three, that 540 mark, um, given some of the conditions now that are starting to appear, drier conditions um, as we get into parts of Western North Dakota and actually into Saskatchewan. So again, something to watch, but we, we try and put these together for some pricing targets as a reference point. Um, so with that, I'll close off my section and we'll hand things over to Tim. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to be with you again on this Friday afternoon. If we go to my first slide, um, a lot of interest, of course, in what calf prices are going to be this fall. In fact, uh, next week, I've got several uh, talks with that's the title. But the two uh, biggest factors that affect fall calf prices are corn prices and slaughter steer prices. So corn uh, was covered very well by Frayne and he showed you the chart and relatively uh, historic low prices and good prospects there. So unlike last year where we had all kinds of problems with getting the corn crop in and so on and, and corn went up a dollar and down that caused a lot of fluctuation in feeder cattle prices. We're not seeing that now. So the other half of the equation is slaughter steer prices for fall calf prices. And so I show you that. And again, we've talked about this several times in this webinar, a lot of volatility. The red line is this year and the gold line is last year. And so we started off the year about the same as as we were a year ago, in fact, the last several years, and actually some weakness already occurred before the coronavirus hit because we had a record number of cattle on feed and and uh, and slaughter weights and so on. But then the coronavirus hit and and caused prices to go down. And of course, in April we really took prices down because the slaughter plants were closing and all that, and just couldn't market them and kind of interesting there, you know, then when slaughter plants started opening up, uh, prices went back up, so a direct relationship there. And we'll see in a minute, but now the, you know, the, a couple weeks ago, we were right on last year, but last week we fell off from last year's levels and we're gonna be down a couple more dollars this week. So kind of uh, below last year. And so now we are going in an opposite direction on prices to uh, the mount being slaughtered. And I'll show you that uh, chart in a minute, but just wanna focus on the futures prices. These are yesterday's close, but the futures market is virtually unchanged 
change today waiting on a cattle on feed report out in about an hour and I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, the, uh, you know, while corn is supportive, fed cattle futures at the present time are not supportive for, for calf prices and would indicate some lower prices this fall. So go to the next slide. I, you know, just mentioned uh, cattle slaughter <clears throat> and we were going in the same direction, but now moving in option, opposite direction. You see, cattle slaughter has recovered very, very nicely, not quite up to the peak where we were there uh, before the COVID hit, but at level similar to the beginning of the year. And uh, so, you know, that's good news. The, you know, the packing plants are operating and uh, up near capacities that they had before. And so we are able to move uh, cattle through and uh, go to this chart on the bottom there is, you know, e you know, slaughter was just off a little bit last week and, and we'll get the new numbers uh, on Monday, but I just followed it day by day and we're doing about same, but actually beef production is higher than it was last year at this time. So we are producing a lot of beef. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see the reasons for that. And the biggest reason is, of course, is that our steer dressed weights uh, contra seasonally have moved higher and are at quite high levels for this time of the year, simply because of the backlog of cattle that we couldn't get moved and they had to stay in feedlots. And so you go to the slide on the bottom, the last cattle on feed report there uh, that came out exactly a month ago, <laughs> Uh, showed that we had a lot more cattle that were on feed over 120 days and that leads into the higher weights and so the big question is you know now uh, this month uh, uh, how are we doing on those uh, on those heavyweight cattle and feedlots so we go to the next slide uh, there is a cattle and feed report out today at two o'clock and so we'll be able to find that out just in a few minutes uh, this is just the range of estimates that uh, uh, that the experts are asked to do before the report. And uh, again, um, the, you know, the average of estimates are for us to be just to have a fewer or less on feed, uh, some lower placements and marketings to be down quite a bit. I have to talk a little bit about some of the idiosyncrasies of these reports that probably miss the press. And one is, uh, on both on that marketing level and placement level is that uh, this year, because of the Memorial Day holiday and the way the calendar falls, there were two less business days, two less business days to slaughter cattle and two less business days for marketing cattle. So that would be one of the reasons why they're down uh, alone. But anyway, you see a wide range in placement figures there, uh, about a 21%. And you know, there usually is a lot of, uh, a variation there, mainly depending on where the experts live and the, and you know, Frain has talked about your backyard and that's kind of the same thing here, what's in my backyard. And so, uh, uh, you know, that's all a consideration there, but you know, uh, just wait an hour and we'll be able to see what happens there. So move along to uh, wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that go back of what's affecting fed cattle prices and, uh, and, and what's ahead. Um, USDA once a month puts out retail, average retail beef prices and as expected, they just soared into April and May with all the panic buying at grocery stores and uh, so on. And so uh, we don't have the export figures for May yet, but you know, anecdotally our exports fell off in May and we've got to wait another almost a month to find that out because of high prices and you know, people that buy from us, buy from us because they not only like the product, but the prices. So certainly that, that uh, probably cuts some, some exports back. But the big question is, you know, you know, fed cattle are going down and retail prices are high and a big spread there. And so uh, is that gonna move around? So go to the next slide. 
is uh, th this is weekly then. So this is what's happened in the last three weeks, actually what has happened by the end of May and into June now. And you see that meat prices are falling off drastically. Uh, there's an old saying, the cure for high prices is high prices. And that's exactly what happened. We had uh, high prices there in May, as we saw in the previous chart that cut exports back. It also uh, cut back buying at the retail level in the US. and so then prices have fallen back to what you might consider. And again, this ch charts are di these charts are distorted by uh, how high they went there in May, but we're right back to year ago levels and average levels. And probably that's uh, good news that being, uh, if there is such thing as normal or average, we're kind of back there and, and volatility um, kind of behind us. This is for chucks and rounds, which were a big ticket item there, and we ground a lot of them for hamburger and so on. So go to the next slide, uh, kind of to uh, continue on here. Uh, Frayne mentioned the drought monitor and it is getting dry, particularly in Western North Dakota, as you see there in the left. And, you know, really, uh, disappointing because not only have cattle producers have to had to deal with, you know, unprecedented pandemic and economic uh, problems, as Brian has mentioned, and uh, unprecedented social unrest. And now we've really got a double-edged sword hitting in that it's getting dry out west and pastures are dry and hay is is heading out prematurely and so on. And so that's another thing to watch on prices. Again, if we have abnormal movement, earlier movement of cattle or whatever that means, that'll affect our seasonal price patterns. And on the right gives us more of a perspective on a US basis, particularly for the cattle industry. The dark green there is major beef cow calf producing areas and then the red dash line is where there's drought and we aren't the only ones in western north dakota cattle country experiencing dry weather you know the biggest north dakota is the ninth largest cow calf state but texas oklahoma missouri and kansas are the top four and so you see texas oklahoma and missouri in particular uh, excuse me kansas some struggling and so in the box up there uh you know 23 percent of the beef uh, cows are now in an area experiencing drought. So that's something for sure for us to watch in the upcoming weeks is does that worsen or hopefully that gets better and it starts raining in all those areas or that could affect uh, prices as well. And so uh, again, we're early in the season. Uh, you know, uh, Stockman's actually had a a cow calf pair sale yesterday because you know it is getting dry out there and we saw a number of dry cows coming to market and, and some excess bulls and so on and so you know really need rain out there and something for us to watch for North Dakota but not only that for prices more so on a U.S. basis. So with that uh, turn it over to Dave to wrap up on energy. Thanks Tim. Yeah I just have a few comments this week about what's been going on in the ethanol market and then some remarks about imports, or excuse me, exports. Uh, another really good week for uh, U.S. corn ethanol. Uh, saw an increase in production, although slight, you know, definitely continuing that trend. Uh, and then use, uh, which the uh, more mainstream fossil fuel guys call input or refinery input, uh, was also up. Uh, and maybe within all of that too, is you know that the days in storage went down, we're, we're burning through the supplies because there's export numbers uh, you know, that aren't here. Again, so moving in the right direction, uh, clearly much better than, than where things were. And, and that you'd probably expect that same incremental growth for the rest of the summer. Um, important to note, there are still uh, some refineries that are, are, are shuttering permanently. There's an announcement earlier this week from, from Coke, down in which they're going to shut down uh, a large corn ethanol refinery in Georgia. Uh, so there's still some, some shaking out to do. Also, uh, numbers aren't here, but looking at where we are uh, versus last June, we're at about 85% of production versus what it was last year uh, at this time, which is good. But remember, the, the industry a year ago was, was still under stress uh, because of uh, small refinery exemptions uh, and that, that uh, demand or that use that wasn't there. Uh, but, you know, pretty close. And then in terms of actual 
uh, use domestically, we're at about 80%. So the, the pull here isn't as big, but it's actually kind of a sign that there are, there are good things going on uh, in the export market, which I'll talk about. Uh, looking at margins, uh, things are looking much better. Uh, just jump down to that simple crush per bushel uh, for the for and they, for for today's numbers, yesterday's collected numbers. A dollar fifty a bushel is a really good number. Um, that is that is one where uh, folks are certainly in the black and and can and, and service debt to maybe get ahead on their debt. Uh, so really nice numbers. Corn strengthened a bit. And again, these are South Dakota numbers, so you know a lot of variation across the the Corn Belt and what other refineries might be experiencing. And clearly, uh, a difference between that and the nearby futures contract. Uh, ethanol is up as well, so a dollar twenty-two. Uh, my my rule of thumb recently is that you know a dollar twenty is about where they could break even. But of course, we have a lot cheaper corn now than we have uh, in, in in much of the recent past. And distillers grains, the prices come back down. Again, I think that there's a few things going on. Obviously, there's more available with more crush. And I think that they've kind of priced themselves out of some rations. And that, that'll uh, continue for a bit. And then obviously, folks just finding uh, other feed that, that can, can serve their purposes. Uh, but again, you know, that, that crush is up to $1.50 a bushel, uh, you know, plus 20% over, over the two weeks is the last time that I uh, reported these numbers. Uh, last thing to talk about, this, this, this slide's a little bit busy, uh, looking at U.S. ethanol uh, by destination. And so a report came out uh, just earlier this month about the, the April numbers. And so obviously April would have included, uh, you know, maybe that peak uh, economic distress here in the United States or that, that time where it was worse in a number of regards. Uh, but stepping back to realizing that China... Uh, and a lot of East Asia were, were a month or two ahead of us. Uh, but that's where these numbers come through. So they, they go all the way through April. So all of those, all of those exports. Uh, some things just to pick up on, obviously Brazil is our largest market. Uh, that is the blue line. Um, Canada is a close second um, most of the time. Uh, and then it gets kind of jumbled you see China down there uh, just hanging out at zero, which is where they've been for a while. You know, that's, that's obviously been true with the trade dispute and a little bit before that. But honestly, you know, China's only been a major ethanol export destination uh, in spurts over the last decade. And a lot of the talk about China is just the potential, knowing how large that, that market is uh, in terms of transportation fuel use. The thing, I, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is looking at that, that far right hand side of all of these lines, so that would be April, is the movement in some smaller markets, uh, Mexico increasing dramatically, Colombia increasing dramatically, even South Korea up. Uh, you know, to me, that's some of that optimism. There's been a lot of work done uh, in the ethanol industry and with the support of the corn folks to build those export markets. And, and you know, Mexico has probably been the number, after China, Mexico has been a number one target. Colombia's definitely been up there as well. And they made some, you know, some their large purchases and deliveries there in April. So, I mean, that's really supportive. And again, this is, you know, 20 million gallons in a, in a month is 250 in a year. So, I mean, that's, you know, for each one of those, you know, Mexico basically, if they'd continue at that rate would have bought, you know, half of North Dakota's production. Um, just, you know, with, with that rate, with a relatively small buyer. And again, there's a lot on here. Uh, there's a lot of other countries on here too, that uh, kind of have that same potential, uh, in, especially in Southeast Asia, where if that work continues, you know, just working into the blend and obviously, you know, prices were low and for, for, for bargain hunters, you know, it's a time for, for folks to pull the trigger. And obviously with Brazil, you know, just, you know, broader than us. I mean, they're, they're, they're in a, a really dire straits with regard to COVID and, and what that's doing to their economy and to their, their, uh, their health system. And I, that, I think that's only going to get worse. And I think that that's going to have a long-term negative impact on uh, fuel use uh, and then ethanol imports as well. And so that's what I had in terms of my comments. Uh, we'll turn it over for questions which I'm not seeing any quite yet, but we'll give you guys a, a couple of seconds in case you do. Again, uh, you're welcome to enter them. Pro we prefer via the, the Q&A tool. Like you can also use chat. Um, and it, 
giving you a second just to, to reiterate when you close your window, you can complete a short survey. And then also, uh, if you're looking for this recording uh, or other, the presentations or other information, you can get them from the websites that are, the URLs that are listed on, on the screen. And I'm not seeing anything yet. So Dave, can I make a real quick comment? I guess you, you had yeah, brought please. up, you had brought up China and, and again, you know, there's, there's potential optimism on the, on the ethanol side. Um, there were some reports that came out late yesterday and early this morning that um, some of the U S officials met with Chinese officials in Hawaii. Um, there were some statements that hit the market this morning that caused a, a little bit of a, a, a pop in the equity markets, but um, not so much in the grain markets and, the, and some positive news, I guess some positive statements coming out that um, again, reiteration that China has every intention of following through on the phase one agreement and in particular in meeting the targets and goals set forth in their expectations for additional purchases, uh, not only of, of agricultural products, but also some of the energy products. Now that, that again, put a little bit of a lift into the equity markets, but it hasn't impacted the grain markets much, at least not as of yet today. And, and I wanted to comment a little about that. It, it's positive news for sure. It's just reinforcement that, you know, there are statements coming out that there is an, a, you know, the agreement is place and we're going to mo keep moving forward. H however, if, if you look back historically, there's been a lot of these kinds of statements that have come out in the two, you know, two-ish years that we've been involved with this U.S.-China trade war. And, and the grain markets have become a bit calloused to those kinds of statements. Um, what they're really looking for from the, the grain marketing side is actual sales. Um, so you'll see much more of a positive uh, market response when you actually have announced sales, even if, even if they're uh, agreements that where there's a, a commitment to purchase, uh, the commitments in writing, it has to be scored and reported through the USDA uh, reporting system. Those kinds of sales where there's actually commitments on the books are the ones that really causes the market traders to change their perspective. So uh, right now, I know the equity markets are, are still paying a lot of attention to those kinds of, of news releases and reports, but the grain markets really haven't. They've become a, a little bit tired of hearing that and then no follow through. So um, I just want to comment that, again, I do think some of those are coming. Um, in some of the previous recordings we've done, I commented on the seasonality of when China usually comes in and buys larger quantities of U.S. ag products. And it's typically not until we get closer to that harvest season. So as we enter the harvest season for wheat, um, it, they, there tends to be a little bit more purchases of wheat. As we enter the harvest season for corn and soybeans is when the Chinese come in and be, be more aggressive in their purchases. So I do think that's coming, but we're just gonna have to be patient and wait for it. Yeah, okay, I'm, maybe I'll make a comment too. We do plan to do this next Friday. And then I think our plans are to take July 3rd off, which is a Friday, but then we're deciding whether to continue these. So any feedback that the participants could give us, whether uh, they think we should go on into July or not would be helpful for us in making that decision. Thanks, Tim. And I'm not seeing anything else up on the board. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, please, if you have any comments, including uh, if we should continue having this as a regular series, uh, to share that uh, with the survey. And uh, hope everybody has a great weekend. Thanks. Mm -hmm.